Stimato ambasciatore, signore e signori, è un grande piacere essere qua questa sera, vi devo svelare un segreto. That's my first time in Brussels. But on, sait, on, on dit, uh, c'est peut-être la première, mais pas la dernière. Voilà. Um, I am very grateful for this invitation and uh, to have all the, also the opportunity to be here with you this evening. Let me start by saying that my background is in developing and implementing public policies. In today's presentation, I would like to give you an overview of the Swiss language public policy. Secondly, to explain my point of view regarding a policy-based approach to multilingualism. Finally, to suggest ways of collaborating to create an international network of uh, public administrations or similar function. That's my goal, huh? that's my role as well. And the objective, my objective, and I hope also your objective, is uh, to share good practice. We are working in a framework between uh, the challenges of uh, public policies and uh, the needs of public policies and the needs for good practice as well. But uh, to start with, I like to talk about just a little the Swiss, the Swiss situation. Uh, we've already, uh, already heard something about, but um, as uh, some of you uh, may know, the Swiss situation is complex. Why is that? Well, we have 17 German-speaking cantons, four French-speaking cantons, one Italian-speaking canton, three bilingual German-French cantons, and one trilingual Romance, German, and English, and Italian <laughs> canton. Je n'ai pas préparé des boutades, mais ça, ça sort spontanément, voilà. What's special about Switzerland is that all 26 cantons decided to join each other and uh, were not forced to do so. It's why we talk about the Willensnation in uh, German, namely a nation born from uh, a willingness to live together despite its language, culture, cultural and uh, religious diversity. Now let's move on to the Swiss language policy. Actually, uh, we can act through a lot of areas to reinforce plurilingualism. The Swiss language policy is based on uh, five pillars and uh, they can be summarized as follows. So develop institutional plurilingualism, especially through translations of official uh, documents and also procurement policy. Promote official languages as uh, German, French and Italian in the public administration. So the, the goal is to stress on the official languages and uh, the national languages have another role. So the fourth language has another role. Encourage comprehension and exchange between language communities. Support the bilingual cantons financially and protect and promote the Italian and Romance languages and cultures in the cantons of, uh, and I don't know, how should I say, Ticino, Tessin, Tessin, Graubünden. So we have uh, uh, a lot of choice in, uh, in Switzerland to uh, translate the name of our cantons. The situation uh, of the Switzerland is uh, directly related to the situation in the Swiss public administration. The Swiss public administration should be a microcosm of Switzerland in numerical and cultural terms, thus representative of Swiss population as a whole. 
The Swiss public uh, administration should be as well a mediator between different parties. By this, I mean developing and promoting plurilingualism in the public sector and, of course, ensuring that it's inseparable from any actions undertaken all over the country in all sectors of activity and at all institutional levels. This approach is not really very well understood, but it's my approach. We should, in this context, uh, we should all accept the responsibility and take up this challenge. And uh, finally, the Swiss public administration should be as well active in, deve in developing this concept of Willens Nation. But how can, how can we do this? So, we have a, a regulation, we have the Article 7 of the revised regulation, and we have some target values. And the representation of the linguistic communi communities should aim at the following ranges, and the ranges are based on 2010 Swiss population census. They apply to federal administration, to the departments, but now, and it's new, it's, uh, it's new with the revised regulation, they apply also to federal offices and uh, their top managers. These languages figures are based on information given by civil servants about their mother tongue when they joined the PA. So we don't know what other languages they speak and at what level. And that's a, it's a real important point to know or to speak about plurilingualism within public administration. The situation here appears balanced in the sense that uh, the uh, values there, the 2014 values, are appropriate values in respect to the uh, target values of the Article 7 uh, we uh, already saw. But in reality, the figures here vary widely in different departments, federal offices and also at the top management. A couple of examples. We have just 4.2% of Italian speakers in National Office of Statistics. And we have just 4.9% of French speakers in the office responsible for the procurement procedure. So, does that mean that Italian or French speakers are not interested in doing this kind of activity or in taking part in important decisions? I don't think so. I'm Italian speaker. I know a lot of French speakers and uh, I am able and I am very interested in doing such as things and also in taking important decisions within the public administration. So, what's the problem? The problem, it's not just the problem, but one of the problem is the recruitment problem. So, of course, it's open to interpretation. We don't know exactly, not yet, actually. As you can see from the graph, many languages are spoken daily at work in Switzerland. But in addition, the language spoken most frequently, 66.2% is a dialect of German, which itself consists of many dialects, 22 at the minimum. So if we have just one dialect, pro German-speaking canton, but within a German-speaking canton we know that we have a lot of dialects. This makes communication in Switzerland very difficult. But 
Can we speak about monolingual plurilingualism? So there is an additional issue, which is that despite its multiling multilingualism, the Swiss linguistic model is predomin predominantly monolingual. So we have uh, the red part uh, as the German speaking part of Switzerland, the green part is the French speaking part of Switzerland, the blue one, the blue one is the Italian speaking part, and the orange one is the Romance speaking part. Given this uh, situation, the public administration has to make a lot of efforts to guarantee its plurilingualism. To do that, the government has chosen the intercomprehension strategy proposed in Article 8 of the regulation. The intercomprehension strategy allows and requires freedom to choose a communication and work language among the official ones. It allows also the use of the first language, so I, I am Italian speaker and uh, I can use my first language as work language. <coughs> I didn't use the right tense because I can't actually. Nobody or not, uh, so not nobody but uh, peut-être nobody. <laughs> Understand, understand Italian within the public administration. So I can speak and work in Italian, but in my office and for, for me, probably for any colleagues, but it's all. The other things that uh, the intercomprehension strategy requires is thinking and working in different official languages and uh, to have also a very good receptive competence of the three official, official languages. So the public administration model is predominantly multilingually receptive. So we have this kind of situation, monolingual plurilingualism and multilingually receptive. But, what does, uh, what's the reality? The reality is that uh, of uh, 200 legislative projects for the period 2010 and 2012, the 76.4% of these uh, projects were elaborated in German. And uh, the 60 0.6% in French, no, in multilingual modus, French and German, and the 7% uh, in French. No project in Italian. Monolingual project. You may be wondering why we had to revise the, regula the regulation despite the fact that the law on national languages and its regulation, so it's a, une ordonnance fédérale, have been in force since 2010. Actually, it was difficult to implement the previous regulation. It's still difficult to implement the revised the regulation as well, because there was and there is resistance to change. And to reinforce multilingualism policy and national cohesion, the Swiss Parliament and the Swiss government requested a revision of regulation. So we have a revised regulation in force, so has, uh, which has been enforced since the 1st of October 2014. And uh, today, after the revision, the role the dele uh, of the delegate needs to, um, so the delegate needs to be able to, inter so the delegate, basically it's me, I was uh, appointed by the government and I have to be independent in my approach so I can make recommendations about any departments and also any federal offices. 
And the delegate today uh, needs to be able to intervene in the key processes to promote multilingualism, to lead the implementation and follow-up of policy measures, and to link the strategic and technical levels, and finally to connect the internal, national and international levels. And that's also why I am here today. How is going to happen? So we've already looked at some of these, but uh, there is an overview of uh, 2014 uh, revision. What this chart shows is uh, the sequence of the relationship between the various steps of the process. We have to develop a more transparent information system to evaluate aims and objectives of uh, the revised uh, regulation, to monitor the implementation and to define the overall future strategy. But a point, a very important point, is also to evaluate language skills, skills of uh, the um, public administration because today we don't have any data to uh, also to, to show the, the real plurilingualism within the public, the Swiss public administration. And finally, we, had, we have also to include the different parts of the language, the language policy, which are going to contribute to reaching a plurilingual public administration. So what are the challenges of this implementation, of the, the implementation in general? We, de, we need uh, to motivate it to convince. Governing by decree is not an option in Switzerland and is not an option here as well, I think. We have uh, to guarantee the trade-off between ideals and the reality. And we have also to guarantee the coherence between internal and external strategy. And finally, we need to turn priorities, aims and objectives into effective, efficient and concrete actions and results by building bridges between linguistic regions, external national organizations and the Swiss Federal Administration. The new uh, linguistic requirements of the Swiss Confederation as an employer help us to show the added value and also the advantages of linguistic skills and to understand their economic values and this point uh, will be developed by uh, Professor Grand. And finally, uh, help us also to reinforce, reinforce national cohesion. And to reinforce the impact of our internal roles and processes, we also need to be active at the international level by sharing good practice, by creating a dedicated net network of public administrations and organizations discharging similar functions. And here, for example, uh, I think also to the International Association of language commissioners, and finally by bringing together policymakers and researchers in a specific network. And there is also a recent initiative in Canada, so the Canadian Commissioner of, of Official Languages has uh, also um, promoted uh, such an initiative to uh, bring together policymakers and researchers. Thank, uh, thanks a lot uh, for um, your attention, and uh, I will be happy to also uh, answer uh, your question later. Thank you. Emile, Signora Mariolini. I think we have a very good overview of the complex reality of multilingualism in Switzerland, like you said. And 
You made it clear that for the Swiss federal administration as an employer to have a multilingual policy is essential and this among others to, to reinforce national cohesion. We'll certainly come back to that later in the discussion, but for now we would like to dive into the economic approach of uh, the question. And there's one question we've probably all asked ourselves once in our life, and namely, do all languages have the same economic value? Are some languages uh, better than others in that sense? If you read The Economist, you might come across that chart, and there you'll see that for an American citizen, you're better off learning German than French, for example. But then to answer the question, I think uh, Mr. Grand, Professor Grand, is the best placed in, in the room. I don't need to introduce him any further because the ambassador did already. What I can add is that he is not only the expert in the economics of languages, but he also has a long-standing tradition of uh, European cooperation in that uh, field, and he actually coordinates the uh, MIME project. He'll say a few words about that, and you have prospects at the end of the room when leaving, if you want to pick them up. And I leave you the floor. Monsieur l'ambassadeur, madame la déléguée fédérale au plurilinguisme, monsieur le recteur, chers collègues, mesdames et messieurs, laissez-moi d'abord, euh, avant toute chose, euh, dire toute ma gratitude pour cette invitation à prendre part à ce Swiss Education Briefing. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you very much for involving me, involving me in, this, in this event. Um, well, as, as regards language, uh, Ambassador Belzaretti fired off uh, uh, the evening with a, uh, with a I think the use of five different languages, I'll be content with using two, uh, i.e. I will present my paper in English, but the paper itself is in French. Uh, so the slides are mostly in French, except for the title, uh, but I will try to you know, present the contents in English pretty much as they are in French, so we can, you know, you can use uh, uh, the two languages at the same time. You know, actually, I think that... Uh, uh, my idea there was to try and uh, practice what I preach. You know, I try to preach multilingualism, and I, you know, I felt uneasy about preaching about multilingualism in one language only, which is why I, I'm, I'm going to try to use at least two uh, during this presentation. And I will start by uh, trying to put the question of the economic value of language in, in context. Because there is a context, there is a so social, political, and cultural context, and uh, uh, as Mrs. Baltazar just said, you know, we're going to be diving into economic questions. But as we dive, let's not remember, let's not forget that, that that we dive into a very complex context that has many layers, many dimensions, and the economic one is only one of them. Uh, I I'm fond of using economics for practical purposes, and I think the practical purposes of much of economics is to help us think about public policy. It it has helped us think about you know, the pros and cons of various options in any area of public policy, whether we're talking about transportation, about uh, culture, about health, but also why not about language. So before we uh, uh, start going into the detail, and also before we start asking ourselves, for example, you know, what is the best way to teach that, uh, this or that language, I think we have to ask ourselves you know, why we do things, you know, what we do, for what reason. Uh, for example, yes, well, what languages should we teach? Uh, and uh, Mrs. Baltas has just reminded us that this question can arise for American citizens as well. What languages should we teach and what languages should we learn? And in Switzerland, in Western Switzerland, where I come from, for example, well, you know, should we prioritize German? possibly Swiss-German dialect, or English, or Spanish, or Chinese? Uh, should we think in terms of a report, which was commissioned by the European Commission uh, about uh, 10 years ago, uh, by, and placed under the, the uh, uh, supervision of a member of the Académie Française, a writer, Lebanese-born writer, Amin Malouf, who suggested the learning, the generalized learning of what he calls a personal adoptive language, une langue personnelle d'adoption, uh, whereby all Europeans ought to invest very deeply, uh, almost intimately, into the learning of one language with which they would develop a deep connection. 
so not just thinking in terms of one language for general communication, but also a, a, a way of appropriating, of getting into uh, a multilingualism and getting the multilingualism into yourself as well. Uh, what is, what's, you know, what, what, how much room and what space should we make for uh, what is known as heritage languages? Uh, there are lots of questions there. Also, in, should do all learners have the same needs? Uh, up to what level of competence? When we talk about learning a language, it makes a lot of difference depending on whether we're aiming for a level such as, you know, in terms of the uh, Council of Europe uh, 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 self self-assessment grid, as it's called. Do we need, well, A1, A2 is too little. Right, so do we need B1, B2, perhaps C1 or C2? You know, how far do we go? Uh, do we need to put the same emphasis on uh, uh, oral or written competencies, oral written skills? Uh, do we need to stress productive and receptive skills uh, 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 as much? Or, you know, or as the translators prefer to say, uh, uh, the uh, active and passive skills. But it's pretty much the same thing. Uh, uh, do we, so, you know, do it. All users have the same needs? Probably not. And for what reasons? You know, why do we know that different users have different needs? So these are uh, uh, all kinds of questions we need to address, and uh, it's all the more necessary that cliches are pretty common in this area. We hear lots of very confident pronouncements in the press, for example, about, you know, we only need this language, or we absolutely need that, or we can forget about that other language. And lo and behold, it's not always, uh, not always that simple. And just to, you know, give you, you know, as, as a teaser, uh, some of the languages for which we find statistically significant rates of return, i.e. some languages Languages that pay off on the labor market include Welsh and Irish. Um, and when I say Irish, I mean Gaelic, right? So uh, <clears throat> let's, let's start by, well, we'll move to the Swiss case first and uh, uh, then expand this a little bit and then we'll get a much broader vista with the presentation by uh, Professor Tarek later. But let's start with the Swiss data right now. Uh, here are some data that come from the, man, from the manufacturing sector, industry, as opposed to services. Of course, we expect languages to be important in the area of services, right? But also in industry. And the data that we have here uh, for this particular slide refers strictly to industry. Even there, we will see that language skills are very important. Uh, this is the uh, proportion of businesses in the manufacturing sector in Switzerland who complain about having insufficient language skills in their staff. Either insufficient, inadequate, or very inadequate in at least one of their divisions. So <clears throat> you have uh, uh, in the, on the horizontal axis needs for French, for German, for English, Italian, Spanish, or other languages with that details. And in green, you have replies coming from the German-speaking part of the country. In orange, those that come from the French-speaking part of the country. Now, look at the need for French. Over 70% of businesses in German-speaking Switzerland complain about not having enough people who have French. We're very, very symmetrically, almost the same percentage of people, uh, of businesses in German-speaking Switzerland, uh, uh, in French-speaking Switzerland, uh, uh, complain about not having enough people who have German. Compare this with the need for English. Yes, they complain about not having enough English, but this is not a priority need. This is w not where the need is the most acute. The need is most acute, paradoxically, in our national languages. This is just one way, after having mentioned you know, the relatively high labor market value of things like Irish and Welsh, uh, it's another way of saying, hey, you know, even if we think that only one language, the one that I'm using right now when I speak, that only one language truly matters economically, it's a bit more complex than this. If you dig deeper, uh, uh, you immediately find that there is a, a, a need for a much broader palette, a much broader range or panoply of, of language skills. Uh, so if we want to get into this, if we want to think about this in terms of economic value, three analytical distinctions will be useful. And I think they are, they are useful in pretty much all cases. First, we have to think in terms of allocation versus distribution. And I'll be, you know, go into more detail in a moment. Allocation of scarce resources and distribution of scarce resources. We need to think about these two levels when we compare options. 
We have to think in terms of market values versus non-market values. Both are important from an economic standpoint. In economics, we think about, well, you know, what are the pros and cons of different options? And in the pros and the cons, you have economic, you have market as well as non-market values. Then we uh, also have to think in terms of private versus social value. Both are important economically, uh, and the computing methods to approach both are slightly different, as we will see. So let's, uh, let's start by uh, the first key distinction, allocation versus distribution. Allocation is about using our scarce resources. You know, this is a basic economic problem, you know, the basic problem of humankind. We would like to have all kinds of things, but our resources are limited. Either we don't have enough money, or we don't have enough time, or we don't have enough love, or we don't have enough whatever, right? But the main problem of human experience is scarcity, at least in the eyes of an economist. And the question, therefore, is, well, how can we deal with this? You know, what should we produce? How should we produce things in a way that does not waste those, waste those scarce resources? And the idea is to maximize the value that we can get out of those scarce resources. The other side of, of, of it, of you know, making choices and you know, selecting between competing options, is that we have to think about how those resources are distributed as a result of our work in creating value. We create value through our work, through our human activity. Now, how is this apportioned between different people? For whom do we produce? And how do we make sure that the way in which this is distributed among people is reasonably just or reasonably equitable? So we have to think in economics in terms of how to use scarce resources and uh, how to distribute the uh, value created through the use of those resources. And these questions occur in any kind of public policy, also in w when we assess uh, uh, language policies. Turning now to my second distinction, market versus non-market value. Market value is what I'm going to be talking about here mostly. I'm talking about values that have, that can be read off a market, can be read on a market, if you prefer, through prices or other types of information. Uh, for example, through language skills, you can have higher income, you can possibly have access to uh, more interesting work, you may have a more, you know, quicker access to all kinds of information, etc. There also are non-market values, and as I was saying before, since in economics we weigh the pros and cons of uh, different options, some of the pros and cons are market-related, material, financial, but others are not market-related, no? but they are ne nevertheless important. We call them non-market. Some authors call them psychic, which is a bit odd, psychic values, but nevertheless, you find this in the literature. Uh, it's kind of dropped out of fashion. We tend to say non-market now. Uh, these are also important uh, from the perspective of the economic weighing of pros and cons, but they're just not uh, uh, exchange in a market. So it's, it's pretty difficult. You have other examples of the same sort of problem when we talk about when we talk about environmental quality, for example. Environmental quality is a typical non-market value. It is valuable, but it's not directly traded on a market. So you have to find right about ways to, uh, to assess it. Examples of non-market values would be direct access to other cultures, pleasures, pleasure derived from diversity for its own sake, etc. And the last thing, the last key distinction that we must bear in mind is to uh, distinguish between private and social value. Private value is something which is perceived and normally appropriated uh, uh, by a, a small decision unit, which can be an individual, can be a household, can be a business. But if you ask questions about value at the level of society as a whole, the computing methods are going to be a little bit different. Even the conceptual approach is going to be a bit different. And uh, uh, you ask there, you know, what is the value of this or that from the standpoint of society as a whole? Sometimes, you know, if we're dealing with cars and tomatoes, we can simply add up individual private values and we get social value. For something more complex like language, culture, it doesn't work like that and you need slightly more involved modes of calculation. So uh, <clears throat> if we combine distinctions two and three, we end up with four levels of value. 
private market, social market, private non-market, social non-market value, and each of these can be approached uh, uh, through uh, uh, in terms of efficiency or allocation, or in terms of equity or fairness, or if you prefer, distribution. So actually you could double this two-way table and think in terms of eight different facets, eight different aspects of, of value. But we'll mostly work on A, and a little bit on B today, right? This is, you know, don't have a lot of time. So let, let, let me move on. So what am I going to present in terms of what, am, what data am I going to use and what results would, lo, would I like to present? Uh, the data uh, come from a representative sample of 2,400 people across Switzerland collected 20 years ago. It sounds horribly, you know, far in the past. It is horribly far in the past, but we've got nothing else. Thing is, in order to do those calculations, what do you need? You need information about things that are normally not collected jointly, namely information about people's language skills, quite detailed information, and information about people's earnings or labor income, in addition to various other things about their age, their gender, what sort of work they do, etc. But having databases that combine these two, well, well, there aren't that many, and that one was collected back then. I hope we can you know, reasonably soon do an update of this. We are one of the few countries in the world that has that. Others include Luxembourg, uh, Canada, and there are a few studies, partial studies in Israel, Australia, and, and uh, one or two more. Uh, but it's not all that common. You know, we've got no, not a whole lot of, uh, of choice there. So, we're still working with those data to some extent we can update them but we need to do a proper update in terms of private market value we will first of all present uh, what is known as gross differentials i.e. simply comparing the average income of people with and people without certain language skills then we will move to what is known as net earnings differential sometimes called rates of return uh, which is the same differences except controlling for, or if you prefer, eliminating the effect of other determinants of income, such as, for example, training. Because obviously, if people have more education, they earn more. So you want to take away the, you know, the effect of your training. You want to take away also the effect of work experience so that you retain only the effect of uh, better or higher language skills, right? Then we'll talk about social rates of return, which is based on the preceding, but it adds one more important bit of information is how much we invest into this, because it's a costly investment to learn languages. <clears throat> then we will briefly talk about the distributive aspects, you know, there's questions about justice and uh, equity, fairness, depending on how you want to call it. And then we'll you know, go through a, a, a brief recap, uh, look at some implications of public policy, and uh, I'll try and propose a takeaway from today's talk and, and provide some references. So let's start with gross earning differentials, simply comparing the average earnings of people with or without skills in a certain foreign language, starting with German. So here you are, and uh, uh, you've got two sets of uh, figures, first for French-speaking, second for Italian-speaking Switzerland. And uh, each of <coughs> those uh, uh, bars indicates, uh, is, is related to a different competence level. Very good, good, or basic, as opposed to none, or virtually none. So in French-speaking Switzerland, on average, let me say on average, people who've got very good knowledge of German uh, will earn 23% more than people who don't. If you only have good competence in German, 12.4% more. If you have basic German, almost 10%, 9.96. In Italian-speaking Switzerland, the rates of return on German are very, very high. Well, rates of return, sorry. The gross differentials are very high, 27.6%. Uh, uh, if you have very you know, re fluent, quasi-fluent German, if you've got good German, 146 and basic German, 9%. Right. Okay, interesting rates of return, well, sorry, interesting differentials, but we have to remember that this may also capture the effect of better training. The people who earn more may earn more not just because they have those language skills, but also because at the same time, and correlatedly, uh, because they have, um, they, they, they have had higher education, uh, which has been conducive to their acquisition of language skills. 
Uh, let's turn to French in uh, respectively German and Italian speaking Switzerland. And there again, you see that you have pretty high rates of return. Less high than for German, but nevertheless uh, uh, a high effect of German on language, uh, on earnings. And finally, let's turn to English, also by region. And uh, we find that in terms of I repeat, gross earning differentials. Uh, you have a you know moderate re, uh, uh, a moderate effect in French speaking Switzerland and a higher effect in German and Italian speaking Switzerland, with earnings differentials exceeding 25 percent, which is very high. Now again we have to statistically take away the effect of things that may be correlated with language skills and this brings us to net earnings differentials so we've got two blocks there the first part the first three lines are for men the uh, uh, last three lines are for women typically you have to run these estimations separately for econometric reasons that we can discuss later if you wish uh, this uh, these data are in a sense comparable with the ones that we saw before, except that in this case we have we, we get well it's not exclusively but it's mostly the effect of language skills because we have taken away through statistical treatment the effect of uh, other important determinants of earnings, namely education and work experience. Work experience which is actually used in two different ways uh, as such and in square terms as well for reasons we can discuss later if you wish. But here you have things that we can start calling it's closer to real rates of return. We normally call them net earnings differentials. And on average, a person uh, uh, in, let's say, a, a man in French-speaking Switzerland who has a fluent uh, uh, German, uh, uh, well, this is, this is fluent or not so fluent. It's good or very good as opposed to basic or none, all right? Uh, a 14% rate of return, which you have, do I have a pointer? No, I don't, doesn't matter. Uh, this is the figure that you have here. It is remarkably uh, 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 symmetrical with the value that you have here. In German speaking Switzerland, a man who has French at a pretty good level will also earn about 14% more. So you see that if you start looking in greater detail about the effect of, earning, uh, of, of language skills on earnings, uh, you get a figure which is more refined and also more robust, more, more solid than what you had if you were only looking at the average earnings differentials. Rates of return for English are, are high, but they're also more different. You know, 18% for uh, uh, in German-speaking Switzerland, 10% uh, in French-speaking Switzerland. We don't have the time to comment every one of those figures. Perhaps one general comment, what is between brackets is not significant at the 95% level, so it's worth looking at, but with caution. Normally we want at least 95%. Uh, and if it says NS, it doesn't mean there is no return. It means that the statistical re uh, significance of the number that we have is too low to be reported. There may be a return, right? But we simply don't mention it because we're not sufficiently confident that uh, uh, it is in the order of magnitude thus produced by, by the, the computer when we run those estimations. Uh, what is important also is that these uh, earnings differentials are, are high and uh, they are well above the average value of an additional uh, uh, year of education. On average, each additional year of education is worth 4.5% of the labor market. This is way more, right? Uh, another way of uh, convincing ourselves that uh, multilingualism is valuable is if we think about this in terms of social rates of return. Think about it in terms of uh, uh, the investment that we make. Because we spend about 10% of total education spending on, on, on languages, not, not mother tongue. L2, L3, right? So, for example, in Geneva, it's mostly spent on German and English. And here you have, um, it's, it's a result of a more uh, uh, complex calculation, um, but, uh, and I will just highlight one figure. In German speaking Switzerland, uh, the rates of return on, let's say, let's take men and women jointly, uh, are about 7.75, say 8% on French, 13% on English. 
uh, which are very high. You know, um, it's, it's literally risk-free. So I don't know if your banker offers you something like 7 or 13% risk-free. They will, of course, offer you very high rates of return, but with a very high degree of risk, right? And not on your portfolio as a whole. In terms of public investment, learning languages, teaching languages, at least in Switzerland, is highly profitable and much more profitable than, than, than many things we can find uh, uh, in, uh, uh, um, you know, on the stock exchange, for example. Uh, in terms of redistribution fairness, let, let me just skip because we, we don't have much time and, you know, time's running fast. So there are two slides there. I can get back to this later if you wish. I simply would like to highlight uh, uh, one, one fact uh, uh, which we will come back in our, in our uh, brief overview at the end, namely that in terms of fairness, and God knows perhaps as a result of the Greek elections we're possibly a bit more aware of this now, uh, uh, but, uh, you know, fairness matters. Fairness matters increasingly. And one of the results that we reach through this kind of uh, uh, approach is that whereas diversity works in favor of fairness, uniformity tends to work against fairness. So if you want to ensure fairness in a multilingual Europe, it's better to be supportive of diversity because it generates more social justice. Uh, the, this is the general overview of what we have seen without going into all the detail, but this gives you an idea of you know, the range of things that we have to cover for a proper evaluation. Uh, we have taken a few steps through this maze uh, uh, in the preceding slides. And uh, let me conclude by talking uh, in this one last slide about strategies for multilingualism. Uh, uh, so there are several possible ways to deal with multilingualism. We can try, as DGT does when dealing with the European Parliament, to have all-out multilingualism in all circumstances. For example, in, at the European Parliament, all 24 uh, uh, official languages of the European Union are normally treated on a nearly equal footing. Call this controlled multilingualism, but it means as much multilingualism as it can reasonably get. Uh, uh, should we have... Uh, Another option could be to have one language only, Esperanto, English, something else. Uh, how far should we use translation and interpreting outside of formal systems? What can we do in terms of public service interpreting and translation, what is known as PSIT? Uh, how far can we go in terms of intercompréhension, that's developing receptive skills along the lines that have been described by, by a federal delegate Mariolini a while ago, you know, a person speaks his or her language but is understood by the others. Um, there are lots of false debates there. Some people talk about English as a lingua franca. Uh, it would be the same thing if it were French as a lingua franca. There are lots of cliches around this, pretending that it is no longer English, it's something different. No, it's still English. And, uh, and the dominant langu language, whether it's English or Urdu, doesn't matter. If a language dominates, domination means privilege, right? Uh, some people say there is something called globish. I think globish does not exist. I think it's an illusion. It's a convenient illusion entertained for ideological reasons. Uh, I think the proper answer lies in a combination of strategies. We have to know when to use full multilingualism, when to use a lingua franca, when to use translation interpreting, when to rely on intercomprehension. And uh, uh, this is one of the goals of uh, the MIME project that has been mentioned before. You've got little leaflets in the back if you want, wish. This uh, uh, project is sponsored uh, by the uh, uh, European uh, Commission. I'm glad to be able to welcome the presence of our project officer, Mrs. Rohanova. Uh, and uh, there is, I think, extremely interesting questions in store over there. So the takeaway, let's, let's, let's not lose sight of the fact that economic analysis is limited. We can say certain things, but don't make economists say what they can't say. Uh, second finding is that competences in foreign languages are usually very for individuals and for states. Where we have data, this is typically what we get. They tend to be underestimated as long as we don't take into account their non-market value. And I have not even talked about non-market value in my estimations. The actual return is probably higher than what I've said. Uh, language policies have distributive consequences. They have implications for fairness and social justice. Uh, and 
a living, sustainable multilingualism probably requires a combination of strategies. There is more information uh, uh, here. There are various links that you might like to follow. Our Observatory on Economics, Languages and Training in Geneva or the MIME Project. Uh, this information is available from the leaflet that I've just mentioned. And uh, thank you very much for your attention. I think I've taken enough time. I'd like to thank you in our four national languages. Grazie Fitch. Well, thank you, Professor Graf, for keeping this complex topic uh, short, actually, and also very pedagogical. Um, we've heard extensively about the, the Swiss case now, and when we organized this uh, briefing, we wanted to have the example of another multilingual country in Europe, and we very quickly thought of uh, Luxembourg, which is a very small country, a neighboring country of Belgium, and we, we don't know a lot of, about Luxembourg at the end of the day. And uh, well, we, we're glad to hear a bit more about the uh, multilingualism policy of the country and more especially of the trilingual university of Luxembourg. And for that, I am glad to welcome Professor Taha, who was not only the rector of um, this multilingual um, university, but also speaks about, I don't remember, you told me, but 10 European languages and so <laughs> no Switzerland because he passed by Geneva at CERN when he started his international research career. So please. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, good evening to everybody. Um, well, it's a pleasure for me to be here, uh, precisely as it was just mentioned, because I spent uh, in the 60s, 70s, and 80s uh, part of my bits and pieces of my life in, uh, in Geneva uh, as a quantum physicist. Uh, so I'm the only speaker here who is not an expert on, on languages, uh, but I love them, I like them, and, uh, and of, of course, uh, uh, being... Uh, the president of a, of a university in a country which is very multilingual and the university itself and, and the only university and the very one, young one I've been very much involved in, in multilingual issues. Uh, so that's what I'm going to tell you a little bit about. Um, ah, is this one? Okay, good. Uh, so, I, yes, I would like to start a little bit first with... Uh, uh, you know, the, the value of languages as a human being. Uh, can I move around? Okay, good. Uh, yeah. Um, now, a language is not just, uh, you know, one language is not the mathematical translation of another language. Uh, it, is, it is much more. It is just a different philosophy of life. And, and that should never be forgotten. Um, you know, you see, you see the problems of mankind or your own problems in a different way if you use a different language. Not because the language comes with the cultural background, with the history. I'm losing this thing here. Okay, no, okay, good, good. Uh, now, the second point is that there are a certain number of conceptual subtleties which are language dependent. You cannot, you know, there are lots of subtle things. In fact, most of the interesting things are very subtle. Now, you can't express them in all and any, in all languages. And there are languages which are particularly suited to express certain subtleties and others not. I mean, let, let me give you an example which, is, which you might know. There are 20 words in Basque for mountain. Uh, so there is a word which is for a mountain which is usually has snow in winter. Another one for a mountain which is rocky. Another one for a mountain with woods. Another one for a mountain you know, with, uh, with grass. Another one with a, with a mountain with, with sheep, and so on. But these are different words. Uh, so this is, a, uh, you know, this is a language which was very much developed in the mountains, and you know, they have developed a very subtle way of immediately telling you a lot about the type of mountain. You can't do it, of course you can do it with, with uh, lots of adjectives in a complex way in other languages, but, uh, but it tells you a little bit about that. Now most... Uh, you, you really do not understand properly another culture if you don't know the language. I'm very radical about that. You know, I know, you know people tell me, no, I'm an expect, ex expert in, you know, I don't know, in, 
in, uh, in Italian literature, but, you know, I, I only read translations. Now, come on, uh, that, that doesn't work. Uh, if you really want to, to grasp a uh, culture, uh, you, better, you better know the language. Uh, yeah, uh, lots of people say, you know, I don't learn this language because it's, it's, it's not nice. You know, come on. You know, I mean, the only way you can, the, you're only allowed to judge a language once you know it. If you know it perfectly, then you can say, well, you know, I know this language perfectly, I know that language perfectly, and I prefer that one. Okay, that's fine. But if you don't look at, uh, know it really perfectly, then that is not acceptable. Um, and, and the last point, it's a little bit the same one as the one of culture. You know, you, you, you really do not understand a, a nation, a, a people, a, bunch, a, a group, if you, if you are not able to talk to them in, uh, in their language. So I think knowing many languages, or knowing more than one language, is no doubt for us as homo sapiens, in, in a world which is complex, a clear advantage. It, you know, there is, to me, there's no doubt about that. And, uh, and, and monolingualism, which is still around a little bit too much, you know, is something which should be, uh, should, uh, should progress. Now, as a professional, about that has been explained to you, um, uh, each new language widens the chances to find the, the adequate job. I mean, they're just the best job for you. I mean, that's elementary. Uh, the more languages you know, uh, you know, it might be that the best job for what you are and for what you know is, requires a language. And if you don't really have that language, then, you know, that job is not for you. I guess that one of the reasons why I became president of the University of Luxembourg, living at that point in Barcelona, is because at least I spoke the three languages, which are the three languages spoken at the university. Had I spoken only one or two, very likely my chances would have been much, much lower. So it, it opens your chances to get the right job. Now business, and of course I can say the same thing about research, uh, in fact, that's what I should have said, but I mean, this is more business-minded here, uh, is international, and, uh, and English is, is the language. Uh, no doubt, research is the same. Nevertheless, and this was shown by the previous speakers, um, the knowing another language very often is much more important than knowing English. English is a must. You have to know it. Okay, let's accept that. Huh? But then, very often, to get the, the good job, you need the other languages. So this thing of English only doesn't make any economic sense, but I think that has been proven by you enough, so I don't have to say anything more about that. It's, it's, it's clear. Now, um, again, many languages means a diversity, and diversity is what we need today. Uh, we need, it, it, it opens your horizons. Uh, it, it gives you different perspectives. And, and when you have the tough problems which we have in front of us, uh, you better look at them from different perspectives. That's to say, look at them from using different languages. It is surprising how much more you get if you have a discussion, well-organized discussion, in different language about the subject, than if you have it only in one language, if the subject is difficult. Well, then there's, of course, traduttore, traditore. Uh, you know, that's well known. I mean, there are lots of uh, uh, translations which precisely because it is so difficult, sometimes by the way translations are beautiful. I mean, the translations of poetry which are excellent, as good as the original, very often quite different. You know, that's the point. It's very often quite different. Um, so, so you cannot really. Uh, there are lots of jokes about that, of course, but uh, I think it's not the day today for jokes here. Not, not yet. Uh, and then, uh, yes, and then, uh, you know, the more languages you know, uh, well, mm, it, it will make it easier for you to accept a job somewhere else. And uh, there's a, in a re recent issue of The Economist, there is a study in which they show that um, uh, if, if you compare the people who live, who work in other countries, then, you know, their country of origin, they are, of course, well, the, the result, by the way, like, like very many of the results by economists, you know, it's quite obvious. You know? I mean, so if you, if you look at them, you know, then uh, there is a chance, they have a, more chances and they get further, on average, of course, than, uh, than those who stay. 
I remember I was with the, uh, with the American ambassador to Luxembourg a couple of days ago, and, and he, he asked me, he's leaving now, and he wants to say bye-bye, so he invited me to have dinner, and, and he asked me, why do you think that the Americans are much more entrepreneurial than the Europeans? Why do you think that they are not afraid of risk as you, the Europeans? And I said to him, well, that's, you know, Darwinian, uh, natural selection. Uh, the Americans come from the Europeans who left Europe. They had the courage to leave. They were not afraid of, of risk. Uh, and we, you know, we are the poor guys. Uh, uh, you know, we, uh, our, our grand-grandparents, you know, they stick to security. Uh, difficult times, but they didn't have the courage, you know, to, to go. Huh? Uh, so. So, you know, it gives you advantages. Um, the case of Luxembourg, now first the country. Uh, Georges, you can correct me if I say something which is not correct. Huh? Um, I, I, I've only lived 10 years in, in Luxembourg, you know, so. Uh, good. It's, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a small but great country, by the way. Uh, now, uh, the country is trilingual. Um, uh, Letzebergish, uh, Deutsch, and uh, Francais. Uh, it, the uh, Luxembourgish became a, the national language on February 24, 1984. You know, I mean, it, it was before that, it was a German dialect. Uh, it, it is linguistically still a kind of German dialect, although there are so many words which are different and so many. French words which have been introduced that uh, a, a German speaking person might have difficulties in really understanding it immediately. It's of course easier uh, for a German speaking person than uh, for, uh, for a French one, a uh, French speaking one. Anyhow, these are the three languages, the official languages, the f languages you can use in the country officially with the administration. But there's a huge difference between, with respect to, to Switzerland, of course. Huh? Uh, there are not 27 or 26 cantons. Uh, you know, there's, uh, well, there are cantons, but the country linguistically is just one country. Uh, so anywhere you can use uh, you can use any of, of these three languages with the administration. Now, of course, the Luxembourgish is all speak uh, uh, Luxembourgish, which, by the way, uh, that was one of the most surprising things when I, uh, when I started uh, learning uh, Luxembourgish, uh, which, by the way, if you move uh, 10 or 15 kilometers to another place, is a different Luxembourgish. So that's, you know, that's like, uh, like the Switzerdeutsch, uh, if, you, if you change the valley. So exactly the same phenomenon you have in, in, in Switzerland. And so what, so what is uh, Moor in, uh, so tomorrow, huh? Moor in one place is Meer in another place. Uh, and, you know, for foreigners who sort of start learning the language, you get completely confused. Uh, you know, they say, come on, there are only three, 300,000 people speaking this, and they even have not agreed upon, you know, at least having a unified, uh, but that's what it is. Huh? Um, now, business and banks, uh, which are banks, as you know, in, uh, are important, uh, not only in Switzerland, but also in, in, uh, in Luxembourg. Uh, they are basically today run in, in English, and, and businesses uh, run in English too. Uh, now, 44% of the residents are foreigners, uh, so that is much, 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 much more than in Switzerland. Luxembourg is a much, 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 much more international place than than uh, Switzerland, and I can tell you because I know Switzerland. Uh, so, you know, so 250,000 said there are 550,000 people living in, in Luxembourg, it's a very small place, it, um, and, and 250,000 are foreigners, and the percentage of foreigners is going up, although not so much anymore because some of the foreigners, like myself, uh, are binationals. You know, we get the Lux, uh, Luxembourgish nationality, we have to pass a a test of language which proves that you more or less that you understand it and that you are able to, to uh, talk to a person for five minutes without uh, repeating yourself, basically. Uh, uh, which sometimes is even not, not easy in another language, you know, but anyhow. Uh, then there is uh, a, a bunch of the, a certain important part of the population who speak Portuguese. They came, uh, they came in the, the late 50s and 60s. And, uh, and then Italian is, a, is, is a, 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 another language which is spoken because there was another an Italian immigration some 100 years ago. 
And although the Italians, the, well, the descendants of those Italians, they are, I would say, completely integrated in the society today, and, and, and there are always ministers who are with, with Italian names and so on, but uh, very many of, of those still uh, use uh, the, the Italian language. So, and then, of course, there are all these other foreigners. So, so the linguistic, the, the language situation in Luxembourg is of an equivalent complexity uh, as the Swiss one. And if you divide by the number of square meters of the country, then it is much, 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 much more complex. Uh, the density of complexity, this is a new concept, the density of complexity is much, much higher. Uh, yeah, and then you have 160,000 commuters. Huh? Now that is something which is unique, basically, to, to Luxembourg. You know, this, the fact that some 39%, 38% of the active force, uh, you know, is, uh, are uh, Belgians, half of them are Belgians, uh, half of them are French, and, and 40,000 are Belgians and 40,000 are, are Germans. And they come in the morning, you know, work and leave in the evening. The city of Luxembourg, in the night, there are, <laughs> in the night, uh, there are 65% foreigners. During the day, 85% foreigners. If you take into account all these people come in. So, so you see, it is a, a extremely international country, uh, which, by the way, and, and that's, that you should understand, the reason why the Luxembourgish became the national language is a question of identity, you know, because in a very small place, uh, which it might be, uh, uh, you know, where, where, where with so many foreigners coming in each morning, and they speak, of course, other languages, uh, you know, leaving in the evening, the danger of losing completely the identity is very high. By the way, the use of the different languages in Luxembourg is extremely subtle. And it took me a couple of years to understand it. And it's not really written in books. Uh, the Luxembourgers know it. Um, in the parliament, they speak Luxembourgish, but they write in French. The laws are all written in French. But if you buy a car, you very likely better speak German. If you t take a coffee, you better speak French. Uh, you know, then there are places where you have to, 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 you, to you try a little bit. You know, I, I say if you work in one language, if you, uh, you know, you try a little bit. So th there is a, depending on what it is, uh, it's, it's uh, frontalier or grenzgänger, which come from one side over the other country, and you learn it. Well, after a time, you know more or less what you have to speak where. Uh, but, but it's not uh, nowhere written, and it takes a time. Uh, but it's, it's very charming, I think. And so it's a very multilingual place. Now, the schools. Uh, so the schools start in Lux uh, Luxembourgish. Now, you have to imagine a typical school. There is a school. I, I have a grandson, and I take him to the, to the kindergarten from time to time. You know, and there are the kids there are, they have all colors. Uh, and, and all languages, you know, it had nothing to do with the uniform school. Um, so, so Luxembourgish is what is used to give them an identity together, something common. And I think it's a good choice. I can't really imagine another choice. Huh? Now, you can, of course, say, well, but it's a very useless language once you are not in Luxembourg. That's true. But that happens with very, very many languages, and nevertheless, they are there. And identity is something important. Huh? So. Uh, uh, then comes German. That is also the reason is very clear. Uh, the, the, the syntax and the grammar of, of uh, Letzeboyish is basically the German one. Uh, if you know, if you have understood uh, conjugation in German, then you you know you, you know it in Letzeboyish. Well, you have to change a few things, uh, but 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 the basis is is the German language. And then a little bit later, next year, uh, one year uh, uh, later, comes French. And, and then in high school comes English. Now, English, uh, although the people in, uh, in, in Luxembourg are not very happy, or often they tell me, well, they don't speak English. Well, no, it's not, I, I don't agree with that. I think the English in general is very good. And my theory is that uh, knowing German and French helps a lot. You know, we, should, we, should, you, we should not forget that English, English has three linguistic in ingredients. Uh, you know, uh, Anglo-Saxon, which is uh, German, uh, French, 
and and uh, Norwegian. And and if you uh, and of course if you, I mean most of the English words you can recognize them if you know French and German. So so uh, so the normal thing of a young uh, Luxembourger person is that uh, he or she speaks these four languages and very often another one or two if they have spoken them at home. So that's relatively good. Uh, there is, however, this is there's always a however or a but. Uh, there's a high percentage of, for, for instance, the Portuguese-speaking kids who do not manage with all these languages. Huh? Uh, they they don't survive. Uh, and the system, the the school system in Luxembourg is not very fair from this point of view. That is my point, my point of view, you know, towards foreigners in the sense that if you don't master French and German, you no way uh, you don't get the uh, the secondary degree, if you don't get the secondary degree, you know, that limits you a lot. There is lots of discussions about that, and I guess that uh, at some point there will be a little bit more flexibility to, to accept that you don't have to speak French and German perfectly. It's enough that if you speak one of the two, uh, you know, uh, and that still will allow you to get along. Now, now the university was... Uh, created in 2003, and, and the government, of course, had, I guess, that, that, that I wasn't there, so I can't tell you really, uh, but the question is, well, are we going to use Le uh, Letzburgish or not? Mm -hmm. Now, it was decided that it should be a rather international university, because that is what characterizes the country. And therefore, of course, uh, Luxembourgish was not part of the choice. Uh, so it was, uh, it's that English was included. Now, so we use three languages, French, English, and German. I will explain a little bit uh, more, more detail now immediately. Uh, there are people, it's, it's curious to say that particularly some extremely good French researchers who always tell me, we should run the whole university only in English. You know, this is complètement démodé, you know, to, to use all these other French and German, come on. Yeah. Uh, well, that's not, not my point of view, but you have to understand that among top researchers everywhere in the world, there is the attitude that if you want to have a good university, you better do it in English and forget all the rest. There is this attitude, and these are not stupid people. Uh, so you cannot say, come on, you know, uh, I, I disagree, but it's not enough to tell them, well, this is nonsense. Hmm? Um, and furthermore, of course, in a country like Luxembourg, to use only a language which is none of the three national languages, that would have been quite surprising, because it's a public university. And very likely people would not have really understood it. Now, there, is, uh, there are some people who say, well, okay, let's use English and French. Now, that choice, basically nobody wants it. Uh, because it is too near the choice of what is going to be happening in France. And, and it would have as a consequence that the university would basically, we have already after the 46% of our students are uh, Luxembourgers, and then the next group are French, 14-15% 14, French. Then come the German, 8%, then the Belgian, 6% then the Portuguese 5%, then Italian 2.5%, and so on, until 107 different nationalities among the students. So the student, studentship are extremely international again. Uh, but, uh, but that would have meant, English and French alone would, would have meant that we would have gotten many, many more students from France. And that was a, a choice which apparently nobody really wanted. So we have kept, we have kept the trilingual choice. And, and I stick to it, and most of the colleagues at the university certainly think that it is the best choice. Uh, it suits the, the, what, how it started, the country, and all these things. Yeah, I'm, uh, okay, the facts is, uh, very quickly, it's uh, three languages, that's not easy to, to run, uh, but you can imagine that. I don't get into it. detail. Recruitment policy is more complex. You know, do, do you take into account only the knowledge about... Uh, uh, algebraic topology of the, of the candidate, or do you also want to check whether the candidate speaks uh, some French and some German? 
Or, you know, do you tell him, well, in a couple of years you have to speak a little bit of French or a little bit of German, and then, of course, you never check that. Right? So recruitment policy is more complex. We have uh, all our bachelors are bio trilingual, which is bio trilingual means, does not mean that you have the choice, but you know that you have the, the obligation to understand two or three languages. Otherwise, you can't, uh, you can't be a student in that program. Uh, so, so passive, passive multilingualism is a must. Uh, the, ex the, uh, the exceptions come in the, at the master level, where uh, one third is uh, just offered in English, and I guess that is going up in the future. Um, the language combinations, sometimes it's French and English, sometimes it's French and German, and so on. That depends very much on the discipline. There are uh, the social. Sciences usually are French and English. Uh, hard sciences are only English. Humanities are usually French and German, uh, and so on. You know, I mean, there are all kinds of, of uh, different combinations. And of course, it limits uh, the, the number of applicants we can have, but that's not a problem. It's a small university, 6,400 students, and we have enough, so that's not. And it allows to have buy and try national programs. We have, for instance, a bachelor in physics, which we offer with a French university and a German university, and the students and the bachelor, they do one year in one country in one language, another year in another country in another language, and then a third year in a third country, in a third language. And when they have finished, they have been living in three countries and speaking three languages. And that's certainly a huge added value. And, uh, uh, and I, I'm finishing now. Um, uh, you know, there are issues. If you concentrate too much on the languages, are you not losing all the other relevant things which have to do with the quality of research and, and teaching? That's not an easy, you know, so the same thing is a distraction. You know? Uh, does our staff and students really uh, know the languages enough? You know, can one assure that they will do? Uh, you know, will it be financially? It's more expensive. And ideologically. Ideologically means uh, we are in a time where nationalisms will be stronger. Uh, you will see that uh, we, we have start seeing it. That always comes when there is an economic crisis, and the economic crisis is not over. Uh, you know, and then it might be at some point that uh, some people in, in Luxembourg will say, okay, you know, uh, let's, you know, let's use uh, Luxembourgish at the university. You know? So these are things which nobody knows. Huh? And conclusions, uh, I think uh, it, it makes an institution which is very distinct, very, very different from the other ones, and, and we are proud of that. Uh, we think it is worth going on, uh, assuring the quality of, of the use of the language. It's lots of fun, you know, to speak the different language of different people, and and um, and, it, it, and if we do it correctly, it is clearly an, an added value for for our students. And and we have not found better alternatives. Thank you very much. for the very lively presentation. Well, I know in my next life I'll go and study in Luxembourg and then I'll work in Ticino, it's all said. Um, well, we've heard about the complexity of Switzerland, the density of complexity of uh, Luxembourg, so I think we, we're ready to go a step further in the uh, a degree of complexity further in the European and or Belgian debate. So I invite the uh, speakers to join the panel.